Welcome to Podcast is Code, a show about the operations side of the software development lifecycle. I'm Mitchell Scott. And I'm Gabe Cook. Today, we're going to talk about static sites. But first, we have a little bit of an update and some current events. So Gabe, two weeks ago, you were talking about uh, you tried out one of the Redis forked or replacement projects called KeyDB. How's that going? <laughs> um, okay, it seemed mostly cool. I did have an issue with specifically one of my apps that I host that caused me to just decide to roll back to Redis before my Git history diverged too much. It worked with most things. For some reason, specifically with Authentic, it kept crashing and getting these weird error loops that... KeyDB would crash? Yeah, KeyDB would just start like logging. It was really long. I don't remember if it was a panic or what, but some big error over and over, and it wouldn't work, and Authentic would be down, and then I couldn't log into things. That's not great, yeah. Yeah, not not super fun. So I decided to, like I said, revert while I was you know, still pretty close in history. There was an issue that was open for that bug that I was having. It's been open a while, though. Um, Someone mentioned it specifically when an app does a certain action, it possibly causes it. So I think it maybe was just something authentic does didn't work great with something KDB does. Yeah, like some function that's not super well tested in KDB that it's just having a bad time with. Yeah. Man, that's a bummer because that's not the new one, right? Because Valkey's the new fork. KDB has been a project for a little while, so I would kind of expect it to be a little more mature. For so years. that's a bummer. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I, that's why I chose it. I expected it to be pretty mature. Like Valky looks cool, but it's a really young fork. So I, I was assuming I'll pick one that has existed for years, but this is how it went. Yeah, I, I think, think maintainers wait. mentioned that they hadn't seen it happen, so they were having trouble replicating and things like that, and it you know, yeah, was lower priority funny. since it hadn't affected them yet, but yeah. So I'll probably try Valky eventually, but for now I'm on Redis. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to wait until I don't... You know, my only issue with Redis is like I don't like their licensing choices, so I don't I'm not reselling their services or or anything like that. So agreed. I just I like to be if I have a choice on a solution which is open source. Right. I, you know. Yeah, I feel for like sure. That's where the most, you know, like innovation will happen in the future and things. But yeah, I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of in a wait and see which how the how the forks go. Like are they gonna combine forces? Is one gonna be like a clear winner? Or are they both going to kind of just go on forever? Um, then I'll make a choice at some point. Which is kind of what I've been doing um, with another project that we're going to talk about. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm kind of in the same boat with Open Tofu. I haven't pulled the trigger yet on on moving anything over there. And I don't think you have either. Yeah, um, so with I that, let's talk about uh, our current <laughs> events, which, I mean, honestly, maybe we should just rename this segment like HashiCorp Updates because... For the last few episodes, it's just been mostly HashiCorp drama. For months now, yeah. Yeah, so, if any of our audience is unaware, a few months ago, HashiCorp did a licensing change. We talked about it two weeks ago. On April 4th, HashiCorp issued a cease and desist to OpenTofu, which is the project that forked like the last open source version of the Terraform code base. Completely legal, completely fine. They were within their rights to do that. HashiCorp, ever since they did that, has been behaving almost petulantly like towards them. Yeah. It hasn't been a great look for HashiCorp. Um, and then on April 4th, they issued this cease and desist saying, and we'll, we'll link to it. So HashiCorp accused the maintainers of OpenTofu of taking code that was committed to the Terraform repo, but it's no longer open source. It, the source is available, but you can't just use it for whatever you want. They accuse them of taking some, some of that code and integrating it into the OpenTofu project, which if true, that's a big deal. First of all, this is a hard problem for I guess all parties, but really for the open source developers, it reminds me of when people are like writing, you know, reverse engineering something like a completely off topic but there's you know been some like game 
uh, like modernizations recently where people have figured out how to take the assets of the original game and rewrite the source from scratch and you can compile it for like a retro game for a modern computer. And they have to be really careful to not decompile the original. Don't look at the source. And in this case, it's even harder because Terraform source code is still public, even though it's not available for you know them to just take. It's still public. They can still see it. So it's a tough problem. Like if you get a random, if you are the open tofu maintainer and you get a random pull request, how do you know that it's not inspired by some terraform thing it's yeah it reminds me a bit of back at similar to you like back in the old days when ibm had the the early ibm pcs and compaq stood up like a whole like they call you know they call it a clean room like they put engineers in there who had never seen the ibm bios um Mm -hmm. or or whatever the the bootstrapping mechanism was and and had them engineer from scratch completely like in the blind a compatible solution so that when the inevitable IBM lawsuit came, they could say like, listen, these guys have never seen your stuff at all. They just happened to build an exact replica. The same thing. Yeah. Completely independently. So I do feel for, for open tofu, that's a really hard thing to do is like be able to see a solution and not take it. And it kind of makes me feel, I kind of don't like source available as much as a result of this kind of nonsense because HashiCorp gets community, they they get the community working to improve Terraform. If Open Tofu makes an improvement, they get that for free. But then by having their source available, it's not good enough for Open Tofu to f- to maintain compatibility with Terraform. They also have to do it in a way that is like demonstrably not derived from Terraform's newly licensed source code. And that's a big burden for the for Open Tofu kind of stacked in HashiCorp's favor, which, yeah, I mean, they built it. It's their right to do whatever, but it makes the source available stuff pretty one-sided to me. Like agreed. A developer can go help out the Terraform project and HashiCorp doesn't have to pay that individual, but the rest of the community doesn't benefit from that unless they use Terraform. Mm -hmm. Like the open tofu side of, of the community doesn't get to benefit from that, from that like non-paid voluntary contribution. And I don't like that. No, no, I don't think. I and like in it. fact, it fragments the community since Open Tofu and Terraform will slowly differ over time. I do. Uh, yeah, they'll drift. Before you know, before we move on too much, I do want to mention like some backstory and details on this one. So I haven't been reading about it as much as you have, Mitchell. And so when I first saw the cease and desist, I did what I do. I went straight to Google and I started searching. I found the commit, like the pull request in open tofu and then i compared the code in terraform and side by side i mean i see how they had ammo here they look very similar it looked initially to me like you know you stole someone's english homework and changed the word so the teacher doesn't notice but the more that you were sending me articles on it and the more i read i started to realize that Open Tofu copied code from another part of Terraform, like another part of Open Tofu, which looks the same as something new HashiCorp has done to Terraform. So it's especially nuanced because this was code they're allowed to steal, but I also see how HashiCorp can say this looks like exactly what we just did. It's very nuanced. Yeah, and I think HashiCorp is also playing up the fact a little bit that this Open Tofu project, like, oh, of course, playing up like it's just a bunch of community run. You know, they're not paying attention. Anyone can just go take our code, slap it into the project, get the PRs merged. I think they're playing into that because at first yeah. I was the same as you. I was like, oh man, they they weren't careful enough. Something slipped in. Yeah, just that's what I thought based too. on the fact that one of these is a corporate entity and one is a group of individuals who probably. I assume aren't as well versed in licensing law because like that's complicated <laughs> and the, the, the Venn diagram of like software nerds and license lawyers probably doesn't overlap that much. Right. I hate licenses. So I was, I was the same way. What changed my mind was on, so that came cease and desist was issued on April 4th is when all this stuff kind of blew up on April 11th, open tofu issued a response and it was really well done. Um, including a, a detailed source code, like step through the functions and show where the, I mean, almost like they're proving the provenance of an art piece. 
like they're showing exactly where this where these things came from over the history of the terraform and open tofu projects if i were to print it it would be 47 pages which is when you start to realize this isn't just some some kids that forked the source code no this is these not, are smart people no this is a and and in in that in the first part of it they talk about all the protections and all the things they have in in place kind of like institutionally to make sure stuff like that doesn't happen and i really got the impression from reading that that these folks are being very careful they know what hey they know what they're doing they also know who they're up against and what that group of people are going to be doing i assume they knew that this day would come at some point and they have all the receipts so after they posted that, and I, I don't understand, you know, I'm not actually a software developer. I do mostly the operation side of stuff. So I can't speak to exactly what's happening in the code and where this stuff came from. But man, if they, if they pulled 47 pages of, of basically proof that they didn't steal this out of their butts, <laughs> then like they deserve to yeah. have it. So I really, I really am inclined to, after reading all of, uh, all of their response, how they talk about the protections they have in place to make sure random people don't merge in yeah, incorrectly licensed code. And also them walking through the history of this, this thing. I'm very inclined knowing only what I know. Like I don't, I'm sure HashiCorp has a side that we haven't seen too, but knowing what I know, I would be shocked if open tofu let this through. Yeah. That's what I thought too. All right, let's move on to our main topic. Um, we're going to talk about static sites. Gabe, what is a static site? A site that doesn't have any like server side generated content. Um, like you typically have, you know, some sort of source files. And I mean, really, it could just be HTML, but typically you use some sort of generator and you have source files that you can change content and run some command and it creates all the HTML for you. So you still can manage content in some way. But you don't have to host a dynamic, you know, like PHP server or Rust or Go or whatever server side. Right. Like this is like Web 1.0 stuff, <laughs> right? Like Yeah, it's weird. I, I, there's things come and go. I feel like people have. I've heard more people talking about RSS recently where RSS disappeared for a long time. And same thing for static sites. Right. Like when I was a kid, everybody just copied HTML files to a server and then that kind of disappeared and everyone wanted dynamic, dynamic, dynamic. And now yeah. all of a sudden there's tons of static site generators and it's cool. <laughs> it's yeah. almost like a fad. So static sites, that's going to be like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, flat files on a server or something getting served to your browser and your browser just draws it. Right. Yeah. And they're great because, I mean, you don't have to worry about scaling up a server or anything ideally in the right circumstances which can be hard to do in other cases but obviously don't always right like there's no fit. database right like there's no database there's not a lot of state that changes you know static it's not a changing thing yeah. throughout the day uh so why why would you want one i mean not having to worry about managing a server and like the simplicity of it can be nice it obviously doesn't fit all situations but I want to talk about later on, like there are still some ways to get dynamic type content in a static site, which is interesting. But, you know, in a situation where it fits, like WordPress is huge and that's fine, but WordPress yeah. can be slow. It can have security issues. It can have all these problems. And if you have a static site and it's just HTML and JavaScript and CSS, there are no security issues. You don't have to worry about slowness. Yeah, you can't do a SQL injection on a on a site with no SQL. On HTML, yeah. So it's scalable, simpler, more secure. I mean, they're fast, too. <laughs> yeah, they're very fast. Straight up fast. At least ideally. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you could screw them up. Like, if you, you know, I mean, you could always load in, like, six megabyte images if you want to, to really just slow stuff down. Yeah. But a lot, there, there seems to be a kind of a... a an upper speed limit or a lower like response time limit to some of these other statics. So it's like WordPress can be fast, but there's also a lot of optimization that people are doing to get WordPress to feel fast because out of the box, it's pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The turning on cache and stuff. Yeah. Like there's multiple layers of cache on most WordPress sites you travel across to make it feel responsive, not in the mobile responsive sense, but in the like just using your eyeballs and not having to wait a second for assets to load. Mm -hmm. These static sites can be responsive. Like 
I actually just updated my blog that's a that's a static site to detect system themes on browsers and change to dark or light mode. Yeah, because you still have client side, of course. Right. There are still some cool features you can get because all that stuff is like JavaScript and, and CSS and HTML. So like it is a mobile responsive site. If you view like my blog on a cell phone, it looks really good. If you view it on a browser, it looks great. If you toggle your system theme, it fades to the right color. These can be pretty full featured. Like you don't have to give up. There's some stuff you're going to give up, but like basic quality of life stuff you still get. Yeah. I mean, like I said, it doesn't fit every case though. So it it really depends. Like you wouldn't want to change a, you know, like a CRUD site, which is create, replace, update, and delete. Like it has an admin side. It has data management. It has some user side. You wouldn't want to just swap that out fully, but in cases where it fits, it's a lot nicer to just to have the very simple scalability of not managing a server. And I mentioned you can still have dynamic content to a degree. There are quite a few services and I honestly don't have um, tons of experience with any of them, but there are very many form submission sites. So you can put a form on a static site and the href will be to some third party service and they just get the responses and email them to you. So you can still have like a dynamic form Um, for comments. There's discuss. I'm sure you've seen um, it's like a embedded dynamic comment section that you can just throw on your blog. And then you have comments, even if you don't want WordPress or something. So you still can get a lot of the features. Like that's probably the biggest (laughs) feature in wordpress that you initially would lose out on like you can make blog posts and stuff but you don't have comments what do i do well check out something like discuss yeah or or, i don't have a contact form but i don't want to put my email out there and and there's solutions for that too because in the past that was a big trigger for like oh you probably need something dynamic yeah if you want to have like a contact us form Mm -hmm. Um, and i've solved that personally a couple different ways like on i have a few static sites that i've built and like again not a developer i'm really bad at front end stuff like i have like none of this stuff is pretty. You you can't see the code. Please don't look at it. Um, <laughs> but like I used Google forms for one. I, I'm the cub master of a, of a cub scout pack here and, and I, they didn't have a website. So I threw one together and I wanted a little like contact us form. And so I made one in Google forms cause we use Gmail and you can skin it to look pretty much just like the look and feel of the site. The forms Google based. Like I get an email when people fill it out. It works fine. Now that solution won't fit everybody, but there are a ton of form solutions out there for stuff like this. So I would bet that if you are, if you need a, a form solution, you could find one. And I mean, in the absolute worst case, if there was one, you could go build like a Lambda that does it. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So moving on, there's a lot of different ways to generate these too. So typically you're not just like editing HTML. Although that's how that's how my Cub Scout site is. <laughs> I was gonna say you can. So I guess yeah, that's fine. I don't recommend it. I yeah. I do want to dive into building like a one of these, we'll talk about it, but like a, I want to build a static site theme based around the HTML I already have so that I it's not as painful to update. Because like, you know, old old school HTML stuff, like if you have just a navigation like header across four or five pages on your site. If you want to add a link, you have to go do that in every single yeah. instance of it. It's cumbersome. It's not great. So there are quite a few tools in this space that let you, and a lot of them use markdown files as the source files. And then these tools go and render out the HTML. And in some cases like the CSS and less so the JavaScript, they'll yes. render out the final assets and you just go put those somewhere. And then there's your site. I've used Hugo a couple times. And I really like Hugo because I don't have to, I don't have to know much about coding to do it. Uh, It's mostly go templates, which aren't too bad. There are a ton of themes out there already. So for the most part, unless you really want to customize how something feels, you can find something that fits what you want to do. Yeah. And all the sites that I've built in Hugo, I've basically taken a theme and there's been a couple things I didn't love about it. And I hacked around or asked you about the <laughs> ghost stuff and we've been able to pretty quickly get exactly what I want. Yeah. And I've had to know basically no coding to not get it have done. to write a PHP website. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so with these, I, I also love Hugo. There's like you said, tons of um, like themes and the themes are essentially like sometimes those are actual like Vue.js sites that just compile to the templates and so you can totally make your own like i my portfolio site 
is currently like a dynamic go site but i've been contemplating maybe trying to make my own hugo theme that i could use to generate the content Hugo feels very aimed towards blogs. They have like blogs and it is, I think, taxonomies yeah. and yeah, pagination on like an yep. index page. It feels very blog e, even though it does work for other things. Um, so one that I have been using lately for documentation sites is MK Docs with uh specifically the MK Docs material theme. I really like. You can. You just give it your markdown files that maybe already exist in a GitHub repo and pretty easily get a site with um I love material design. So like a material design navigation and like sidebar and you know dynamic content there and it just builds in your CI pipeline and you don't have to worry about the content. When you update your readme and your repo, you get a new site. So I've actually I've probably used MK Docs more than Hugo. Yeah, all your doc sites look really good. Thanks, man. Yeah, I I probably spend a long time tweaking them and stuff. Probably too long, but yeah, I want them to have like a good experience, even though it's not you know, some dynamic thing. What I was really impressed about with MK Docs is it has search. It it uses this plugin that like indexes your pages and it creates an index file, and you actually can search through the site without any issue. But there's no you know Google widget embedded or anything it's just client side static search using an index which is pretty oh, cool. interesting so it's not even using a third party like any kind of dynamic service it's all no yeah it's not using algolia or oh, anything cool. like that which you wouldn't yeah. typically cool. use it just like generates that index and it's configurable like you know how much content you want it to include how exactly you want it to index how you want the search results to be formatted but then when people type it just finds you know finds whatever's in that index yeah so it just runs through the index during the build process like the Mm -hmm. it just generates it i think it's just like a javascript file that's cool that gets loaded when you click the search box i've used that one probably the most uh one i haven't used as much actually two that are kind of in the same vein but i'd like to use they seem really cool there's a astro has been really popular lately and there's also veet press and those are a little more code heavy they're aimed at letting you make a site so you like create a Vue.js website and I, i'm sure there's similar frameworks for others sorry i kind of live in the view world so that's what i thought of first but they let you you know design a Vue.js site add all your content and then build it to a static site um so it's cool that you can write Vue like normal but instead of it compiling to like a a spa a single page app where you know usually with Vue you'd like use api calls against the back end these can actually just like hugo does generate a page for each you know whatever post or data you have yeah yeah it feels like those are targeting more front-end devs Mm -hmm. and like hugo's targeting like some dude who wants to have a blog and i think both are equally like valid ways to go because like i'm I'm not going to learn front end development to have a site. Yeah. But I will learn enough about Hugo to like hack, hack it together. I know like at work, our company's considered doing some of these like Astro static sites because we have some really talented front end devs and they'd be probably miserable in Hugo because it, it doesn't play to their strengths. Right. But why not leverage the stuff they're already doing? Like they're already doing view stuff. Why not do that and then just render it out statically? Exactly. Like why write a theme yeah. and compile it? And then write your markdown files and then compile that when you can just write a view site that dynamically creates all the pages. There are WordPress plugins that do this. You could actually, I don't know how well they work. I've never tried it. I I kicked the idea around up for a while, but there are WordPress plugins that like you will run WordPress basically as your static site generator and they'll have plugins that export just the raw like HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Amazing. Um, which is kind of a wild way to do it, but I mean, if if it works, I can't imagine that a lot of the other WordPress plugin-y stuff that people do, like, you'd lose that. So it'd be yeah. probably if you just have a blog. Like, there's no way you're doing, like, WooCommerce on a static site. Yeah, exactly. Side note, too, about Astro that I just think is hilarious. Their, like, little, I guess, marketing site, the Favicon, whenever the tab is focused... It has this little fire, like it's a rocket, and it turns orange. And then when you tab to a different browser tab, it turns gray. I don't know. I just think it's cute. Random sidebar that I just had to mention. Oh, I don't need to know that you can change. You can change favicons by. 
That's cool. Yeah, I assume they're just hooking into when the window gets unfocused. And when they receive that event, they just swap the, the favicon out. But that's cool. So yeah, I mean, like <laughs> we funny. mentioned, these things can be pretty powerful. They can be interactive. Like they're they're yeah. full websites. This is not, you know, I joked about being web 1.0, but this is not, you know, black text on a white background with no with no CSS. Like this stuff can be really nice looking. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. Um, and then another one which I don't love um it's a lot slower to build but it it still takes markdown files and generates a site and is pretty commonly used for one big reason um is jekyll it is the default static site generator used with github pages so if you have a repo you had a bunch of markdown you go to the repo settings and turn on github pages it'll just convert your markdown to a website for you with no extra configuration and there's a button to say which theme do you want and github gives you a little pop-up with a like i don't know maybe 10 different themes and you can just pick one and that's all jekyll behind the scenes not my favorite it's a little bit older it its builds are kind of slow um i've had it requires like a whole ruby environment versus hugo which is like it's just mm. a single binary since it's go so i've had issues installing all the things I think early on, I couldn't get them all working on an ARM Mac. Like some of the dependencies I couldn't get to install. So not my favorite, but it is pretty commonly used and really easy to set up. So. Yeah, you mentioned GitHub pages. Let's talk about some of the ways that you build and deploy <laughs> these things. So at the end of the day, we're taking, I guess it depends, right? So like in the Hugo, MK Docs, Jekyll land, you're taking a bunch of markdown files and then all the other stuff like theme information and unconfiguration. And you need to put those through some black box. And on the other side, out comes HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, with Astro, like you're putting in view. And on the other side, you get HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Yeah. So you're taking some source files that are not in the format you want them to be. Because they're not things that can be consumed by a browser directly. And, and getting them into those things. So let's talk about that. So in the in the really olden days you would have to move all these files. You'd have to, uh, you're probably handwriting HTML and all this other stuff, or you, you're just like, what was that? Like Adobe Dreamweaver or whatever it was. <laughs> oh, geez, um, yeah. And you're getting those files and you're like FTPing or SCPing those to a web server. Right. Um, I, I don't want to do that. There's gotta be a better way. I agree. It's the whole like pets versus cattle debate, I guess. Then you, have a server you have to manage it does work but you got to keep up on updates and you know then it's a possible security issue putting files on a web server not cool not devops don't not want ideal. it um more devops would be like docker you could go get like the hugo runtime or or the astro runtime and and generate all the files and then just copy those into like an alpine image yeah, and you can do that all in the Docker file. So you do a Docker build. Right. Like you could just dump so multi-stage build, right? Like yeah, get yeah. get your builder to build the thing and then in just like a like an Alpine Nginx image, go grab those output files and, and serve it up and you're golden, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But like that also I mean, that is DevOps. Feels like a lot. But then yeah, you yeah. still have a server that you have to host somewhere. You gotta set up a Docker server. Or something complex that I'm a huge fan, but I will admit Kubernetes is complex and I think it is overly complex if you just have static sites. Yeah. I ran my static sites in my in my Kubernetes cluster for a while. And it was fine because it's not the only thing in there. It's the it's the workflow like I understood. Like I wrote my own Docker file from scratch for it because it's so simple. But we can do better, right? Honestly, this might be the most complicated static site hosting solution. Um but it's it's really dependable and it's used everywhere. So you can just spin up an S3 bucket and like put CloudFront in front of it in AWS. I've only deployed like one thing through CloudFront. It was kind of it wasn't super intuitive for me. Yeah, I love CloudFront. I think it's an incredible product, but it isn't. Yeah, it's not simple to set up. I the first time I used it, I was pretty lost. And then the second time I was only partially lost and then. The third time, maybe I felt slightly comfortable because, um, yeah, they're setting pages all over the place. It's not, you know, typical AWS fashion. It's not the prettiest thing ever, but it is very right. reliable. So all the assets are going to live in a bucket and then you just front it with like AWS's 
CDN, right? Yep. Cheap. Really cheap. Really cheap. Yeah, it'll cost like pennies a month. Possibly free. But the downside is um, it's a pretty simple integration. Like you've got a bucket, which is a file system, CloudFront, which is you know like a caching CDN layer. You have to manually build in CI and push your files to the bucket and things yeah. like that. Um, but it does work. So probably the most commonly used solution here, um, because again, it's just the easiest to set up is GitHub pages. Has some downsides, but it's it's free for like public repositories. If you just have Markdown, you just check a box for the others. You still need CI, but it's easier than like having to log into AWS. You can just build the site and they have an upload like deploy pages action. So, yeah, and I think like for Hugo, I think they have documented examples of like, yeah, how to do that. They do. And you just copy and paste their CI. I, I ran a couple of my sites and GitHub pages for a while and I, I switched away from that. Yeah. So that I mean, the main downside is it the repo, unless you have a like a paying account, a pro account, the repo has to be public for yeah. GitHub pages to work, which I understand that the assets like the rendered assets are going to be public because they're on the public internet. They're just the site. I understand that. Don't have a problem with that. Obviously that's how this stuff works. The whole repo though. I don't love because I'm, I, I'm not a dev. I'll make stupid coding mistakes. I will, I'll make really ugly either HTML (laughs) or Hugo template mistakes. And I will commit that. And I, that's I'm usually fine. when I'm messing with this, when I'm messing with this stuff, it's late at night and I don't bother doing like a, a an amend and I just, com, my commits are just descending into madness and I don't, no one needs to see that. That's no fine. That. I've never loved that excuse because it's fine. Nobody cares. Nobody looks through your commit history. I doubt many people actually dig into a repo, but I mean, it is a fair point though, but I feel like the bigger issue is so with things like Hugo, again, I know it's all public, but it's not necessarily all just listable and Hugo lets you not publish a page. So you can have, you know, content, right. Which is accessible at some specific URL endpoint. And again, I, I know it's public, but people probably won't find it if it has, you know, a year month day and then a blog post title. But if you have your repo public, people can just go look at your markdown file and then just go, Oh yeah, I have yeah, it. So yeah, Hugo, you can have drafts or you can have hidden stuff. And I don't think those get rendered. I think there is a way. Is there not? Can you not make it just like unlisted somehow? Maybe not. You might. Uh, I can't remember, but I think there is definitely a way to completely not render those out. Okay. Um, yeah, that but you're right. If the repo is public, you can see that stuff. Yeah. Then it doesn't matter. So yeah, I don't know. I, I think that this next one is a better offering anyways. I think it's just I so agree. cool. So we really started toying with this one pretty recently. I, I don't think it's existed for very long, but Cloudflare made their own like static site hosting option uh, called Cloudflare Pages. And it's pretty similar to GitHub Pages, um, except you don't have to set up your own CI pipeline. They support a ton of tools out of the box. You just link your Git repo, click a drop down and say, this is a Hugo site and it'll just build it for you. Right, That's what you're doing, isn't it? Yeah, for all my Hugo sites, I told Cloudflare it was a Hugo site. I gave it the repo and the branch. Actually, I don't even think I gave it the branch. Maybe I picked my production branch Um, and it builds it. What is incredibly cool is like, not only does your repo not have to be public, which is, which is, you know, maybe a thing for you. Maybe not. You get temporary builds. Like if you push to a branch, it will build you. It'll build that for you without you having to do anything. Mm -hmm. And so like, I was changing. I was like adding a dark mode to my blog. So I had like a dark mode branch. It's just building the whole time. And when I'm ready to test it, I can just click the test URL and it takes me there and I can view it on, you know, like with Hugo, I'm doing local builds. Hugo supports like hot reloading and cool stuff like that. So I can see it locally, but I can't see it on my phone locally super easily. Yeah. It's annoying. But with Cloudflare pages, as soon as I push that up to GitHub, it's on my phone. Cause mm-hmm. like I can just browse to the, the ephemeral environment they've built for me, which is super nice. I also really like it for like depend bot or renovate type updates. I host some repos there. Yeah. And anytime I go to merge in, you know, the 10, 15 PRs I've accumulated over like a week or two, I just click the link site. still looks good. Merge it in, move on to the next one. I do have tests, but it's nice to just have a final pass before I merge too. 
Yeah. And Cloudflare also supports like a one click adding their analytics to your site. I don't know if GitHub yeah. Pages does or if you have to do something else. I've never tried to do analytics on GitHub Pages. GitHub Pages doesn't really have analytics. But with Cloudflare, like you click a button. So that's super nice. Obviously, yeah. you get all, a lot of benefits from being in Cloudflare. And this is all free. Like we're talking about free stuff here. Um, there is a limit that I haven't hit yet. Um, on, on the free tier of Cloudflare pages, you get 500 builds a month, but that is a lot. Yeah. That is and a lot. I think we haven't had to try it yet because we're well under that with all the stuff we use static sites for. It seems like there could be some ways around that where you, it kind of takes away one of the benefits, which is that awesome, not having to write a GitHub action. Um, but I think you can get around that by doing a GitHub action that just does a code upload to Cloudflare pages. Yes. I think that gets around their build limit. So that's a high number. I, I've never hit it, but I actually, <laughs> I didn't want to ever get to a point where I like hit my Cloudflare limit and I can't deploy a site. So I actually have set yeah. my repos up so that the non-production branches just use a Cloudflare build and deploy. But my like master, my main branch I run a CI pipeline and I deploy it myself. So like if I ever run out of builds for whatever reason, I'll just have to merge the PR and your production branch can still go. Yeah. Yeah. So I still get the awesome PR deployments, but I also don't have to stress about the 500. I doubt I would ever hit that. I just don't like limits. And I was afraid I was getting (laughs) close because I was like I said, I was making a ton of changes on my blog over like last weekend. Um, I mean, like a bunch. I added a bunch of cool features cool to me features Mm -hmm. and so i went to look and i was like oh man i bet i'm in the hundreds for sure and it was like 39 and then i realized that was not 39 this month that was 39 ever it was like 15 so i don't know 500 is a lot i'm sure some people out there would hit it but especially if you've got a bunch of sites and this is like what you do i'm sure it'll hit it but then you can probably afford to pay for one of the the better plans or Or cci yeah, or or pay one of your your guys to build build the pipeline because it's not hard, right? Like it's a it's basically it's basically a bucket copy, right? Yeah, I mean they provide that they have a GitHub action and it gives a pipeline. You just copy. Oh, and okay, paste cool. Because I think fundamentally this is using their bucket storage. I'd be shocked if this isn't like their what is it R two? Yeah, on I'm the sure back it's R two probably. Although I mean R two is cheap. You get I think the first ten gigabytes for free and stuff like that, but this feels cheaper because they give you an entire website hosting. So I don't know. Probably are. Yeah. I mean, this stuff is, this stuff is free, like free, free, like GitHub pages and Cloudflare pages are zero cents a month for basically all. I, I mean, I think it is all you can eat traffic. As long as you stay within the build limits, like you're fine. Yeah. S3 is. and CloudFront. Those are going to, those will cost you some pennies depending on usage. Um, some Docker solution, unless you're running it at your house, it's going to cost you money. Mm-hmm. And, it is very fast. So another one that I want to mention, I don't have as many comments on it. It's a great tool, but didn't feel as much of a fit here is uh, Vercel. I, I love Vercel and it does have a free tier. Vercel's great. They do similar stuff with like temporary environments, just linking up the repo. It does the builds for you. It's very similar to Cloudflare pages, but Vercel lends itself. I feel like they advertise more the dynamic side. Like they talk about how they support 35 different like frame, like language programming languages and they, you know, host it on a serverless instance for you. The downside is it can, it, ha- it can have a cold start time and Cloudflare pages just doesn't. Oh yeah. So Vercel's great. Um, that would be another one I'd look at, but I love that Cloudflare pages. There's no cold start times. There's no cost. It just kind of works. <laughs> and this isn't an ad. I'm just a big fan. Yeah, I've had no issues. I mean, I've, it, like if you're if you want to play with this stuff, I would try all of them. Like maybe not Docker and definitely not like SCPing files to a web server. Yeah, don't but do that. Try GitHub pages. Try Cloudflare pages. See what fits. Um, like obviously if you're not using GitHub at your org, then that's not going to be a fit at all. I don't know if GitLab has a pages solution. I'm they sure do. they do. It's called GitLab pages. I have never used it. I can't speak to it. Try it out too. But at the very worst case, you can just chuck this stuff in a bucket and front it with any CDN and you'll be golden. It's really simple to get this stuff deployed. And it's one of those things where even if it takes you a little bit to figure out the first deployment, if you're doing it right and you're writing CI to do that, or you're leveraging like GitHub pages or Cloudflare, which is doing CI on the back end for you. Once you solve it, once you're done. And then, I mean, another benefit of these static sites is 
there's no security updates to to the front end, like to the site that's running. Obviously, like Hugo and these other tools, they'll have updates over time. And I had to deal with some breaking Hugo changes, which wasn't that big of a deal. But the nice part is until I got everything fixed and ready to ship, like my site's still running because it's just HTML. Yeah. So like that site, if I walk away, that site in 25 years will run just as well as it does today. And it also will not be insecure. Like, so that was the impetus for me learning this stuff was I was running an ancient version of WordPress that I had my blog on for years to the point that I got so nervous about it. I pulled it offline and it just ran inside my, like my house. <laughs> um, and I went to upgrade WordPress and it fell and apart. And the upgrade right? path was so bad that it ended up being easier ah, to see. rebuild it in Hugo and then have a static size. All That'll never happen to me again. Yeah. I mean, not the same way. So I'm sure... I'm sure something I'll do something terrible to myself in the future. Um, but I'll never feel the need to pull down the public facing site because of security issues, even if it's, you know, a decade from now. Mm -hmm. So that's really nice. That's a big benefit to this. Uh, I, I really like not running a database. I don't like, I don't like dealing with databases. I'm not a DBA. I don't like it. <laughs> I love them, but sometimes you don't need them. Well, and that's the thing is like for something like this, you don't need it, exactly. but like you can't run Facebook or Netflix or like you said, like some, some backend no. admin, you can't yeah. do that. What would be really cool. And, and like, I mean, let's not pretend that writing Markdown is super easy for, for casual people. Like if my wife wanted to have a blog, would I have her use Hugo? Uh, maybe I probably have her write stuff, not in Markdown. You know, she's not a tech person. I don't, she wants a WYSIWYG editor. Yeah. That reminds me, there was like a CMS type UI where you could edit the content and it would commit it to your repo, but I've never been able to get one to work for Hugo, honestly. I feel like Netlify had one. Yeah. I think it was Netlify that had a Hugo one, but it was rough. The stack was not good. It was not containerized. I never got it working. Um, that is a weak area of this space is casual, like just wants to have a blog, which is wild because like Hugo's built for people who just want to have a blog. But kind of the, the price of entry is no, learning Markdown. Yeah. Which isn't insurmountable, but it's also not WordPress where you click like new post and you get basically Microsoft Word and you can type things how you've typed it mm -hmm. for forever. Yeah. I want a tool where you can do that and then it commits to your repo and you don't have to think about getting That would be incredible. That would be incredible. And that I think that would take off too. The yeah. issue would be like all of these, like Hugo supports a ton of stuff. I'm sure all these do, right? But like Hugo supports short codes and all kinds of cool overrides and stuff you can do. And I think it'd be hard for a tool to solve all of that. Well, because it's, it is pretty customizable under the hood. Yeah. Although I'm sure some do exist. Like if anyone's used one, let us know. Cause that would be great. Not specifically to, for Hugo, just for anything, any of them. Yeah. Yeah. Because that is a weak point. Like you wouldn't want to hand this to a family member necessarily and say like, Oh, here's your blog right here. Yeah. So that, that is for sure a downside. Uh, it's more of that like upfront investment and then kind of pay that back by the sites free to host. There's not really maintenance on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There still could be like, you know, security concerns, but nothing as bad as like you said, like SQL injection or yeah. command right. injection or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, um, that, you know, those, those are really the ones we've used. There's tons more. I mean, I played, played with fly.io. It was pretty nice. Um, there, there was, what else did I write? Railway render.com. <laughs> There's so many. Um, if anyone has any tools they like, I would love to hear what, which other ones are good. Yeah. Yeah. I've just kind of, I mean, I played with Hugo for a couple of years, but that's really my first step into this space. So I'm sure there's other stuff out there that I've, that I've missed too. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's funny cause you and I have such different like approaches. I want a low or no code solution and you're like, I'll, I love, I'll code. do a code. Yeah. <laughs> I think oh. I think you feel almost limited by Hugo because it's not you can't just go write what you want, right? Well, it depends on what I'm doing. Like I I've built Hugo sites for quick things, but usually I would rather yeah. reach for like VPress or Astro and like build a site yeah. and then just generate a static site with it. Um, so it's nice that you can do either one. Well, that's why I don't know that like these tools are competing with each other. They solve such different things yeah. for different people. I mean, I guess mainly they solve the same thing, but for different people exactly. or different groups of people. Yeah. Um, so there's, but like you said, there's a ton of tools in this space. We mentioned the Netlify CMS. I should give them 
an honorable mention too, right? People love Netlify. I have never used them, but I think Netlify is amazing too. I don't know. Well, I think the first step is to admit that you have a problem and your problem is you have dynamic sites that don't need to, to be dynamic. Like most little marketing sites don't need to be dynamic necessarily. Yeah. If you haven't played with static sites and or or haven't played with them, you know, in a long time, you might look at what's out there and see if you could do it statically and, and you might yeah. surprise yourself at what all you can do, what all you can get done for um, in a static site, no database running for free in Cloudflare. Definitely. Thanks for listening. Our website is podcast as code dot show. If you would like to suggest topics for us to cover or have feedback on topics we have covered, send us an email. Our address is contact at podcast as code dot show, or you can hit us up on our discord. Join us in a fortnight for more DevOps content. See you next time.